hopefully at this point you've got a sort of solid understanding of the principles of training also the role of testing and baseline testing within that training with that stuff in mind we want to think about what is good practice what is good practice when it comes to training programs what should we be seeing what should we be uh, considering in fact i'm going to start like that what must what must we consider you must consider these things you must consider these things so it's a fairly general kind of statement but let's sort of get into some specifics off the back of it so what must we consider well first of all obviously we must consider someone's current fitness levels um, that's going to be done through our baseline testing if you haven't done that tutorial that is probably something that you want to engage with and see what that sort of protocols uh, that sort of protocol is baseline so we got that baseline sort of testing idea fantastic so we need to know someone's current fitness levels. obviously if we don't do that we're not able Able to um, expose the appropriate let's say frequency intensity and duration of training we can't begin to progressive over progressively overload because we haven't got where the starting position actually is for example we may well not have one repetition max if we're doing resistance training we may not have heart rate max we may not have a multi-stage fitness test result if we're doing more continuous type stuff now secondly that was meant to be a very different color but it ended up quite similar there we go we've got to consider the age of the participants in our training so we a couple of points here we want to be cautious not that you can't do it but we want to be cautious with high impact so this would be things like plyometrics weight training um and so on perhaps interval training to an extent high impact for children so for children we want to be really cautious because of the potential impact on what are called the epiphyseal plates the growth plates of the bones um, that, that exist at the ends of long bones we want to be a little bit cautious that that is the right age to be doing certain types of training and i think a really good example of that would be plyometrics excuse me would be weight training for example in fact let me put that in i want to say that plyometrics that's those eccentric followed by rapid concentric contractions. Plyometrics are often, often what we call air quotes contra indicating. Contra indicating. That means do more harm than good uh, for young and old. Okay. And that also applies to the less fit, by the way, for young and old. So for young people and old people, um, old people, what sort of term is that? For, for more mature people, this is going to be less likely to be the choice that one makes. Why? Because it's likely to do more damage than it is through um, you know, health and fitness benefits. Now, let's go to another point here. I think this is a really neat point. We need to think about the phase of the the phase of macro cycle. So remember, macro cycle is the overall, probably annual or or twice or two yearly cycle of the sort of the outcome goal we're trying to make, you know, get into the team, achieve a certain uh, finishing position, get into a certain squad, get into a certain league position, this sort of thing. Now, what must we consider with the macro cycle well for the most important things is there are times in that macro cycle where tapering must be done tapering is the reduction of training why because we want the athlete to come out of the adaptation process and reach peak performance so tapering leads if training has been done well to peaking so peaking peaking not that <laughs> I'm not going to get into that peaking as in to peak that's what we are <laughs> that's what we are talking about there now other other factors i want to talk to you about uh sex differences or gender let's talk let's use the term now it sound like um milli vanilli there let's let's talk about sex if you don't know the reference then sorry i can't help you with that one now we are talking between men and women there will be two types of differences there will be physiological differences and let me just choose a slightly different color there will be other kinds of differences which we are going to refer to as hormonal i'm going to go on to these in quite a bit of detail in a moment the hormonal differences but physiological differences first what might we anticipate is different between men and women um, well first of all we need to consider that females and this is a fascinating statistic one uh, one um study has shown that females are twice times too likely to experience acl anterior cruciate ligament injuries now this is something that i've anecdotally noticed in things like women's football compared to men's football for example there seem to be more anterior cruciate uh, knee ligament injuries okay that's quite an interesting one but men men are more likely to have upper body injuries more likely 
upper body injuries so that's something that we can kind of just build into our consideration and if we're doing lots of dynamic work with females for example we may want to keep in touch with kind of scans and checking whether that acl is actually in good condition or not uh, it, it is is over stress being placed on that now with the hormonal stuff a couple of things i want to mention here that i mean the, mo the most important thing here is that males obviously we're looking at sex differences here males they have greater up arrow testosterone levels okay so testosterone is far higher in men about 10 times more common men produce um uh, nine tenths of their testosterone in their testes which of course women don't have uh, by definition so what this caused the impact of this is about the, the development of muscle mass fast Okay, muscle mass fastness. So when men train, they are able to develop muscle mass on average, there are exceptions of course, faster. And that is because testosterone is the hormone that helps in the production and association with training it helps with the production of lean muscle tissue and then finally guys and this is where i want to sort of spend a little bit of time is we're going to talk about the uh we're going to talk menstrual cycle now obviously this by definition uh, only influences females unless someone tells me different uh, this only influences females so what this is what i'd like you to be aware of with the menstrual cycle i want you to be aware of i mean by the way um your exam board your your board has produced a really lovely graphical representation of the whole menstrual cycle i teach it in my biology courses if if that becomes sort of an assessed element i'll go and actually put, put an extra tutorial in about the actual graphical representation of this but i want to simplify what we're talking about in that 28 day cycle i am going to argue here that we have two primary phases to that menstrual cycle we have the follicular phase the follicular phase which again i'm not going to describe here because i've got whole tutorials on elsewhere and we have got the luteal phase the luteal phase okay now what i want to talk about is the differences between these two phases generally and how they might impact how we go about putting our training program together so first of all with the follicular phase gen this is the first phase of the cycle so this is um this is uh um post period what we're saying here is that there are decreases in hormone levels there there are fewer hormones being produced as a, as a result of the, of the menstrual cycle what that enables a female to do is to engage in much harder training which will which will make more sense in a second much harder training during that period of time moreover they've got up arrow better access better access to glycogen stores so during the follicular phase females can access glycogen stores better now considering that glycogen is the fuel source for both the aerobic system and the anaerobic lactic acid or lactate system glycolytic system that becomes quite interesting moreover women are better able in this period to build muscle easily okay M build muscle easily so all of a sudden this becomes a period of time where strength training and high impact so let me put it in here high impact training becomes the thing to seriously consider so the phasing of this should be seriously considered now the luteal phase is different what happens here is we get the increased release of <laughs> what have i done the increased release of estrogen i'm doing this with the uh, british english spelling by the way if anyone's questioning me on that uh, estrogen and we get the increased release of progesterone progesterone okay and the impact of these hormones is that what we get is we get a down arrow a decrease in what we call anabolic anabolic adaptation that is muscular adaptation to training so in the follicular phase we're getting increased anabolic adaptation in the luteal phase we're getting decreased anabolic adaptation so what do we do in the luteal phase as an athlete we are advised generally loads of exceptions focus on lower intensity exercise this is maybe where we over focus on our continuous strength work our flexibility work for example and one of the terms that you might find described about this luteal phase is that energy is locked up energy locked up now think about that for a second just in terms of logic now this is going to be very basic sort of scientific consideration but if there's a possibility in the luteal phase that um well i mean absolutely going to happen that a female is heading towards either pregnancy or um or period uh, or the ending of that menstrual cycle then it makes sense that energy is locked up for that purpose okay it makes sense that there's a preservation of energy in those circumstances that's what we're talking about and the other thing we find in this particular period is more water is needed 
Okay, so sorry for spreading out a little bit here, but more water is needed in that period as well. Whereas in this follicular phase, we're talking here about easier hydration in this phase over here. Easier hydration. So basically, what we're saying basically is go go for it in the follicular phase and then do lots of kind of longer uh, duration, lower intensity stuff in the luteal phase. And that, of course, helps us with the variety of training, even though those two, set, those two periods of time would be relatively similar in and of themselves. Um, can we also just say that we're looking at a generalized model here? This is if the cycle... This is in some sort of a cycle that's predictable, you know, and there's many menstrual cycles that are absolutely not predictable uh, and, and are variable and are not reliable in terms of their time phasing and things. So that's something that you want to um, be aware of. Oh, sorry, the other thing I meant to mention in the follicular phase as well is that temperature is cooler, is that the body temperature is actually a bit lower. Sorry, I meant to say that earlier. Okay, and that obviously that has certain impacts when, when one comes to train because you know it can be more comfortable uh, to do so than if temperature is high, higher in the luteal phase okay hopefully that's useful cheers